بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا بلغ العلا بلغ العلا بكماله بلغ العلا بكماله كشف الدجا بجمالي حسن الجميع صلوا عليه صلوا عليه صلوا عليه وآله الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد The eve of the 17th day of Rabi al Awal, a day of joy and mercy, a day in which Amina bin Wahab delivered the mercy to the universe the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam she says as i was about to give birth i saw a nur a light that came into the room and then all of the sudden when the light went away, I saw the boy, the child, with his left hand on the ground in the state of prostration, sujood, and his right hand is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reciting words of tawheed, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I heard a voice calling me, Ya Amina. You've just delivered the master of this world. So name him Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And indeed she did. She named him Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And he grew up, of course, as an orphan of the father. 
Abdullah had died before the birth of this holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And they needed to search for a person who can nurse him, give him some milk. Halima al Saadiya, she said, I went to Mecca with my husband and a child, a boy that she had. She said, We had an old camel that did not even have much milk. There was not much milk in that camel. And I used to ride a donkey, an old donkey, and I myself did not have much milk. But we came, and people who would breastfeed, they came to Mecca, and they started to look for children whom they can nurse for a payment. Many people rejected the Prophet ﷺ. They rejected him. Because when they asked about him, they would tell him that he is an orphan. His father had died. And people did not want someone without a father because they wanted a higher pay. As I was searching for someone to take, I heard a voice. Who is there? who has not yet found a child. I asked, whose is this? Whose voice is this? I was told, this is Abdul Muttalib, Sayyidu Quraysh. This is Abdul Muttalib, the master of Quraysh, the head of Quraysh. So I approached him. I said, yes, I have not found a child yet. He said, would you like my grandson? Would you accept him? And she said, well, since I did not have a child and he is the grandson of the head of Quraysh, then why not? I told him, okay, sure. He told me, what is your name? Who are you? I told him, I am Halima al Saadiya from Bani Sa'd. Qala bakhin bakhin. He said, great, good news. Ismani Jayidan Hilmun Wasad. He said two great names. Her name is Halima, the forbearant. Forbearing. Somebody was Halim, forbearing. Not this Halim that you eat, huh? You know, that's, uh, you know some, some people might be hungry now. <laughs> the dinner is in a few days, so keep, you know, stay a little bit, you know. The dinner, inshallah, is in a few days for the wilad. So, Halim is forbearant and Sa'd. As you know, from joy, from happiness. So he said, great name. Two great characteristics, two great names. Characteristics that are pleasant for eternity, these good names. Which is kind of a reminder for us, brothers and sisters, to make sure that when we name our children, we give them good names. Give them some good names. Some people try to be unique. In naming their ch children, they, they want to give a unique name. It's okay. But Khayrul Asma Ima Hummida wa Ubbid. Ma Ubbida wa Hummid. The best of names are those that are Abdul something or the Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And the names of our Imams alayhi wa sallam. We have so many names, alhamdulillah and attributes of our Imams alayhim salam and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam It's good to have a child given such a good name. Look how much effect the name has on the individual and the people he interacts with. You know, they say, Shay Bashay Yudkar, you know, they say there was a man from the Arab whose name was Mujrim. You know, Mujrim means criminal, criminal, you know. Subhanallah. True story, huh? You know, sadly, it's a true story. His name was Mujrim. You know, I don't know why his father, what was he thinking, you know, when he named him Mujrim. This man, he came to pray one day in the masjid, Salat al Jama'ah. He came, he stood in the first line behind the Imam. First line. The Imam, after Surah Al Hamd, started reciting Surah Al Mursalat. Surah Al Mursalat. 
in the 29th juz of Quran. He said, Alam nuhlikil awwaleen. Did we not destroy the first ones? First ones referring to the old, you know, nations from all time, like Ad, Thamud, the tribe of Nuh, the people. That these are awwaleen. He paused for a second. He said, the first ones. He said, I'm in the first line. This imam wants to destroy me. So he took a few steps back in the salat. The ayah then continues, the next ayah. ثُمَّ نُتْبِعُهُمُ الْآخِرِينَ Then we follow them with the later ones. He said, oh, this imam also wants to get to me. So he took further more steps. Then the imam continued, كَذَلِكَ نَفْعَلُ بِالْمُجْرِمِينَ That's how we punish the criminals. Mujrimin. So this man ran away from the masjid altogether. So then what's the matter? He said, this imam wanted to destroy the first line, the second line, all, and then he came after me as well. So I will never pray behind him anymore. You know, that's, So it's good to name somebody with a good name, a pleasant name. So the Abdul Muttalib told her, great names. You have great names. So great, you take him. Take my grandson. She took him. She says... That donkey I was riding was old. It barely made it to Mecca. The minute I took this man, this boy, the minute I took him, this donkey all of a sudden had so much strength that it used to surpass all other animals, all other rides, horses, camels, donk, everything. My husband went to the camel that we had, which was also old, and did not have much milk. All of a sudden, this camel had so much milk that we used to eat, my son used to eat and become fed up. Usually my son would sleep hungry because there is not enough food. I don't even have enough milk. And I started having so much milk and my health improved like we've never seen before. So I realize this boy is a blessing, is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a blessing. And indeed, she said the minute from the day he came to our house, blessings started to arise and come to us. And this is no surprise. If Isa ibn Maryam salamullahi alayh says in the Quran, وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتْ Allah has made me blessed wherever I am, then it would not be surprised for Habibullah to become Mubarak Aynama Khan, wherever he is, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Then the child grew a bit older. He lost his mother, he lost his grandfather, so his uncle Abu Talib took care of him. At the age of 12, Abu Talib wanted to go in a journey to Sham along with some of the heads of Quraysh for a business trip. This Prophet came to his uncle. He said, yeah, oh my uncle, where are you going? He said, I'm heading to Sham for business. He said, why do you want to leave me behind? I don't have a father to take care of me nor a mother to take care of me. Why don't you take me with you? So his uncle felt sorry for him. He told him, come, come, let's go. From the minute they left Mecca, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a cloud that came to shade the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi throughout their journey until they came by a church. In that church, there was a priest or a rahib, an abbot, by the name of Buhaira or Bahira. Bahira noticed something different. This group, this caravan, usually passes by on its route by this church. But this time, this caravan is unique. He realized there is something different about this caravan this time which caught his interest. He noticed a cloud 
in the sky covering or shading one individual. So he came out of his abbot or of his church and he told the group, I would like to invite you all into my church. They told him, Bahira, you've never done this before. We always come by your place. How come you've never done this? How come this time? He said, this time I want to invite you all. I want you all to come to my church. You're all my guests. They all came. Bahira saw that the cloud is still sitting out there. He said, are you all here? They said, yes. He said, no, there can't be. Somebody is missing. They said, yes, there is a young boy whom we kept him behind to look after our camels, our horses, our goods. He's out there sitting under a tree. He said, call him as well. I want him to come as well. So they called him as he came. Bahira saw the cloud moving as well. When they all sat down, he said, who is the father of this man? Abu Talib said, I am his father. Because in the Arabic language, Al-Am, the uncle, can be named as a father, Ab. And that's how we justify the ayah where Ibrahim السلام, spoke to his father, Azar, as the Quran says, who was a kafir. He was telling him, Oh father, believe in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People say those who do not refer to Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam or don't even have an understanding of the Quran, they say this was his father. We say no. A prophet cannot be given birth to by somebody who's a mushrik. And our holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has a hadith which says that Allah did not keep me among all my progeny up to Adam alayhi salam into a father or a mother who were mushrikeen wal'iyadu billah. They're all muwahideen, muslimin. From Adam till his father and mother. And our proof is the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah where Ya'qub speaks to his children. He says, when I die, what religion will you follow after me? They replied, we will follow the religion of your religion and the religion of your fathers. Who? Ismail wa Ishaq. Who is the father of Ya'qub? Ishaq. Why did his children say your fathers, Ismail wa Ishaq? Ismail is not the father of Ya'qub, but his uncle. But in the Arabic language, an uncle, Al-Am, can be referred to as a father. Hence, Azar is not the father of Ibrahim, he is his uncle. Nonetheless, Abu Talib said, I am his father. From that sense. Bahira said, can't be. You can't be a father, his father. This boy should not have a father. So then Abu Talib elaborated. He said, well, that's true. His father is my brother. He died before his birth and I raised him. So Bahira said, now you're saying the truth. Take care of this child. For this child is going to be the master of this world. Sayyidul Qawm, Sayyidul Alam. Take care of him. This is what I have read in the scriptures. This is what I've read in the scriptures. Which is an indication that indeed the mentioning of the Prophet ﷺ is in the scriptures. As per our holy Quran, when Isa السلام, in Surah Al Saf tells his followers, that I am giving you the news of a messenger who will come after me. His name is what? Ahmad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This prophet then grew and indeed as he received the message he became Sayyidul Alam. In fact before even he received his message from the second he's born, in fact, before his birth, from the second of his creation, the creation of his nur, he is the mercy. Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, he asks our Prophet, this is found in Bihar al-Anwar, 
He said, Ya Rasulallah, why are you the best of the prophets when you are the last one to be sent? He said, Ya Jabir, the first thing that Allah created in this world, in this universe, Nuru Nabiyyik, the light of your prophet. And when it was the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked all his creation to confess to him of him being the Lord, I was the first to respond and confess before we are brought to this world. In Alam al dhar as referred to in Surah Al-A'raf, in that world, I was the first. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me the best of his creation. And he made me as the last messenger. So indeed, he is a true master and a master who has compassion and mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and describes our holy prophet in this ayah, which is 128 of Surah at tawbah that we just recited. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ A messenger has come to you from amongst yourselves. You here is referring to all humankind, all humanity. Humanity, a messenger who is also a human being like you, has been sent to you. This messenger Azizun alayhi ma anittum. He really feels the difficulty that you experience. It really gives pain and agony to his heart. Anytime any individual in this world experiences difficulty, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi feels pain for him. Even his, the mushrikeen, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi would feel pain for the mushrikeen because they don't want to believe in his message. They don't want to believe in his message. After the battle of Uhud, they told him, Ya Rasulullah, make a dua against Quraysh for what they have done to us. On the contrary, he said, Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamoon. Oh Allah, forgive my tribe, for they don't know. They don't know. He used to feel pain because they don't believe in his message. Azizun alayhi ma anittum, harisun alaykum. He really takes care of you. He cares about each and every one of us, mu'mineen and mu'minat. The Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares about each and every one of us. One day he was sitting down with his companions. He said, As-salamu ala ikhwani. Qalu awalasna bi ikhwanika ya Rasulallah. Qala bal antum ashabi. He said, As-salamu ala ikhwani. Peace be upon my brothers. They said, the companions around, he said, aren't we your brothers, Ya Rasulallah? He said, no, you're my companions. They said, so who are you brothers, Ya Rasulallah? He said, a group of people who will come after us, who will believe in me without having seen me. Those are my ikhwan, my brothers. Those are ikhwani, brothers. Which means, Mu'mini and Mu'minat, it is you and I, insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. Bil-Mu'minina ra'ufun rahim. Ra'uf and rahim. Two attributes of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah never gave those two attributes to any of his messengers in the Qur'an. If you read the Qur'an from beginning to end, in fact, Allah mentions it about himself in Surah Al-Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah bin nasi la ra'ufun rahim. Inna Allah bin nasi la ra'ufun, Allah, ra'ufun rahim. And Allah says about Holy Prophet, our Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, in Surah At-Tawbah, 
Raufun Rahi. He gives his attributes to his holy prophet. Compassionate, merciful. Now this prophet, brothers and sisters, who's compassionate and merciful, indeed, look at how he transformed people's lives. Look at him. Fatima al Zahra'i alayhi salam says to Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad. Says to the Ansar and the Muhajireen in her khutbah, al khutbah al Fadakiyya, to the people. She says to them, Tashrabuna al Tarak. You people used to drink water which was contaminated with Najasa wal Iyadu Billah. That is what Tarak means. Before Islam, they used to drink water contaminated, contaminated with najasa. وَتَأْكُلُونَ الْقَدْسِ وَرَقْ You used to eat dirty food. No, if we translate, translate it somehow. Dirty food and, and leaves. Leaves, we're not talking about edible leaves, non-edible leaves. They used to take them and eat them. This is what they used to eat. And she continues, أَذِلَّةً خَاسِئِينَ you were humiliated. You had no dignity. You're afraid that people will come and strike you from all around you. You don't live in peace and security. Allah saved you. Through his messenger, he saved you. Indeed, that was the state of the Muslims or the people in Jahiliyyah before Islam. Humility, lack of dignity. They used to come and do tawaf around the Kaaba naked. Naked. They would take all their clothes off and they would do tawaf around the Kaaba. What is their logic? Their logic is that we want to disassociate ourselves from the materialistic world. We don't want anything materialistic on us. We want to go around and this clothes that we have, this materialistic clothes, they're contaminated. Contaminated in what sense? You know, we cheat, we lie, we bribe, we take interest, we steal. That's how we obtain these clothes. So when we want to come and do tawaf around the Kaaba, we want to be pure. This was their logic. So people used to come and go around the Kaaba in such a state. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayah how Islam gave dignity to human being when Allah said, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, we have sent down for you libas, clothes, that will cover your private parts. Warisha and give you dignity. Give you only you look good in your clothes. Waliba taqwa dalika khair. And what's better is to cleanse your inside. That's what Islam gave to us. And you know what? The other day, a couple days ago, two, three days ago, I was reading in the news, by the way. You know, somebody would say, you know, back in those days, was somebody doing tawaf around the Kaaba naked. Well, this is all the news. You know, you'll be surprised. A couple of days ago, I was reading here in some cities in, in Canada. This, is, this city is one of them. Somebody is doing naked yoga for men. They would come and do naked yoga. What is his logic? His logic is that they need to disassociate themselves from the materialistic world. Ya subhanallah. Tell him, ya akhi, you know, the Arabs in Jahiliyyah were 1400 years ahead of you. No. 1400 years they were ahead of you. Subhanallah. And he says that people need to feel good about their body. Let them accept their body. No. No. Ya subhanallah. So, when people leave religion, leave religion, that's where they will end up in. In such a society that is disintegrated from the social status. Socially, this society is in a catastrophe. Even children-wise, you know, the, our Holy Prophet ﷺ, look at his compassion, look at his rahmah. He says, when you get married, have children. Have children. 
I will be proud of your children on the day of judgment. And this society has gone backwards now. To the extent I was listening to the news the other day, also just last week, a few days ago, I was on the radio. They say this Canadian society is a problem. It's in in, in a problem because to have a growth in a society, you need a birth rate at 2.1 children per family. Two, that's you know, the statistics. I don't know how you have 0.1 children, but nonetheless, that's what the numbers are. You know, I'm not a statistician, so I'm not sure how that works, but nonetheless. They say we are below this number in Canada today. We're below, not only Canada, many other so-called developed countries in the world, they have problems. They have problems in this. He says if we continue this way, we'll be in trouble. SubhanAllah, look at the laws of Islam. Even in this, Islam has addressed this issue as well. Islam has addressed this issue as well. And then those who argue that if, you, if we do what Muslims do today, mashallah, 10 children, 12 children will be in catastrophe, as is we have, mashallah, 7 billion people in the world. Where will they all live? Economists reply back to you. Economists, not me. Economists, they tell you that the world has enough wealth. Has enough wealth. It is a problem with the distribution. Not the wealth. There is enough wealth to accommodate people. I mentioned this in the, past, in the past, Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who won the Nobel Prize for Peace a few years ago, in one of his books, he says, we have enough for wealth in the world to suffice everybody. But the problem is in the distribution of the wealth. So if the distribution is fine, there is no problem. So Islam came, look at the compassionate nature of Islam, look at the dignity Islam gave to people, the transformation. In their behavior, in their food, in their dress, in their social life. When people leave that, look what they end up. Even if you take a look at this society that we live, or societies that left religion. Look at them 60 years ago, 70 years ago, when they had religion in their, in their lives. How much their life was different from today. This prophet who gave us all these gifts... And Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam who've given us all this guidance, this compassionate prophet who cares about everyone and everything, including the plants and the animals. A hadith that says he used to lean against a tree in his masjid. He would use that tree kind of as something to lean against when he delivers his khutbah. Then the Muslims approached him. They said, Ya Rasulallah, why don't we build you a member, a pulpit, so that people can see you and hear you better? He said, if this is in the benefit of Muslims, do so. So they did. They built him a member. When the member was built and they brought it into the masjid, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came into the masjid as he sat on the pulpit, everyone in the masjid heard that tree weeping. The tree was weeping. Loudly, the Prophet ﷺ came down from the member. He went to the tree. He said, calm down. I did not leave you because I am neglecting you or because I'm unhappy with you. I am leaving you for the benefit of Muslims. That's why I'm here. So don't feel bad. This is narrated by Muslims. People who will say, how is that possible? Well, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows Musa alayhi salam to revive the dead and Isa alayhi salam, like in Surah Al-Baqarah, when he revived the dead, and Isa alayhi salam could speak to the dead, why would our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam not be able to speak to a tree when Sulaiman spoke to an ant? An ant. So why would our Prophet not speak to a tree? There is precedence in the Quran for this. So even with plants, he would care about them. He cares about everyone, everything. This Prophet who calls us our brother, his brother. If we ask ourselves a genuine question, do we love this prophet of, pro of God? I want each and every one to ask yourself this question.
Do I love him? And I'm sure the answer is yes from all of you here. Because if you don't love him, you would not be here tonight. But the next question I want you to think about. I love the prophet. How much? How much do I love the prophet? That is a question to think about. And that varies from one person to another. In the battle of Uhud, when the Prophet وسلم, was about to be killed, and many Muslims got killed, when he came back out, when he came, Sa'ad ibn Ma'adh, who was one of the heads of Al Aws, a good companion. Sa'ad ibn Ma'adh came and his mother came. His mother. His mother came, Kabisha. And she said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, it is good to see you alive. The Prophet looked at her and said, I give you my condolences about your son Amr, the brother of Sa'ad. He got killed in the battle. She said, I don't care about my son Amr. As long as you are alive and you are fine, that's what I care about. How many of us have that love to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? that we're willing to sacrifice a son just to see him being fine and safe. Some of our women do not even want to sacrifice wearing hijab for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obedience to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Some of us don't want to sacrifice some time to attend the majalis of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Last week we had the wafat or couple with the wafat of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam How many people showed up to the wafat of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam Do we really love him? And people come up with excuses and we all have excuses. I am busy, I have school, I have work, I have this, I have exams, I have that, I have family. We can come up with hundreds of excuses. It's too cold outside. Now, those who are ill, those who have some children and things, that's we have. But sometimes we create excuses. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam talks to al-Fudayl ibn Yasar. He says, Ya Fudayl, do you gather amongst yourselves? And he's referring to the Shia. Do you gather? Do you sit? Do you have majalis? He said, Yes, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. Qala inni uhibbu tilka al-majalis. Fa'ahyu amrana. Rahim Allah man ahya amrana. Imam al-Sadiq said, I like these majalis that you have. I like them. Imam al-Sadiq is telling us these majalis he likes. Now if I know there is a majlis that the Imam likes, why would I not attend that majlis? When I have the time and the ability to attend. Why? He says, attend these majalis, I like them. And revive our traditions. May Allah have mercy upon those who revive our traditions. How many of us do so? Comes Thursday night, people don't show up. Comes Salatul Jumu'ah, people don't show up. Comes other majalis, people. And we always are busy, 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 busy until Malakul Maut comes to us. At that moment, the human being says, Ya laytani qaddamtu li hayati. فَيَوْمَئِذٍ لَا يُعَذِّبُ عَذَابَهُ أَحَدٍ وَلَا يُوثِقُ وَثَاقَهُ أَحَدٍ I wish I had prepared myself for this day. Now it's too late. Now it's too late. How many of us watch our akhlaq and manners and behavior? How many of us watch our attitudes with each other, with Muslims and non-Muslims alike? This story is quite interesting. They say there was a alim in Isfahan, the city of Isfahan in Iran. 
this alim at the time of his time there was only one clinic a hospital one and there were only two doctors in the whole city of Asfahan only two they did not even have much business people who are not sick you know they would sit down reading the Quran you know asking Allah to send them rizq you know, you know. read the Quran the whole day people at the time they used to eat healthy food natural products not like what we see today mashallah in the supermarket today you go to the supermarket you know if you have time one day pick up some item and read the ingredients read the ingredients brothers and sisters I have a PhD in chemistry and by God wallah sometimes I don't understand what's written on these things I don't understand what's written there so God knows what we're eating these days mashallah you know today the lineup at the doctor mashallah is from here till mashallah the end of the street Everyone, hypertension and diabetes and blood pressure and this and that, mashallah, you know. So doctors are doing well these days. They don't need the Quran. That's why they love the Quran today. You know, these days they don't need it. Back in those days, people were healthy. Everything is natural. So those two doctors sat down doing nothing. You know, they would read Quran. This alim became ill one day. He went to see this doctor. Went into their clinic. He entered... Before him was a lady, and he could hear, you know, forget about patient confidentiality and all this back then, you know, there is no, not, none of that existed, you know. So he's sitting right in the front of him. The doctor is talking to this lady. This lady came from the suburbs, you know, from the villages. And she really did not have much education. You know, she was a simple lady, you know, very simple, not educated. She came and she told the doctor, she said, doctor, you told me to take, to take this prescription, prescription, take it, boil it in the water and drink the water and that'll be fine. I took the prescription, I put it in water, I boiled it, I drank it, nothing happened. This piece of paper, I took it, put it into the water, boiled it, nothing happened. So the doctor became, you know, he, he lost his mind. He said, are you crazy? He said, what kind of a woman are you? How could your husband be still patient with you? <laughs> Don't you understand? When I said take the prescription, means take the medication in the prescription, not the prescription itself, put it into the water and boil it. So people around him, you know, they started to laugh at this poor lady. A simple lady, you know, she didn't quite understand his advice. But then the doctor kind of, you know, if a doctor does this in this day and age, he'll be sued, you know, of course, you know. You can't say he can't open his word, his mouth. So, anyways, she said, sorry, I didn't know. He said, okay. He felt bad. He said, okay, let me write you another prescription. You take this, you go to the pharmacy, in so-and-so place, the medication he gives you, you put it in water, you boil it, and you drink that, and inshallah, you'll be cured. That's what you need to do. She said, okay. And then she left. So if you want a prescription, I have one, you know, here. Right? Just, yeah. This one you don't need to boil, just read it. Inshallah, it will give you some. So, for a different disease, for the heart diseases, this one we have. So, she left. The alim then entered to see this doctor. The alim looked at the doctor and said, Doctor, what have you done? He said, what have I done? He said, you've lost your adalah. You're not Adil anymore. In other words, people would not be able to pray behind you anymore. You're not just. One of the conditions of the Imam to lead Salat is Adala, to be Adil. Adil means he does not do Wal Iyadu Billah, sins in public in front of people. He does not do backbiting Wal Iyadu Billah. He does not insult people Wal Iyadu Billah. That's one of the conditions of Adala. And if he does, he has to ask for forgiveness and do istighfar and tawbah. Then yes. He told him, you've lost your adala. What have you done? And you've angered Allah. Didn't you hear the hadith narrated by our sixth imam, Imam al-Sadiq, salamullahi alayhi, from the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, man ahana li waliyan, faqad tasadda li muharabati. 
anyone who insults one of my servants, Wali, Wali, a mu'min, anyone who insults a mu'min of mine, then he has come at war with me. Hadith al-Qudsi from Allah. Allah said, the Holy Prophet, Imam al-Sadiq, from the Prophet from Allah. Allah says, anyone who insults my servant, my wali, a mu'min of mine, he has come to fight against me, a war against Allah. Imagine, how many mu'mineen do we insult on a daily basis? Now, you ask, you tell me here. Through ghiba, through backbiting, through attacking, through accusations, sometimes to the extent where we don't even think about it anymore. We go to sleep with peaceful conscience because we're so used to it, so used to it. You mention the name of fulan, so-and-so, and immediately the other person, yeah, so-and-so, you know, that guy, you know, he's always a troublemaker, you know. This is ghiba, ya akhi. A person the other day asked me, said, you know, when the khutaba come, some lecturers come, and they give majalis. Can we talk about them behind their backs? Would that be considered ghiba? I said, ya akhi, it depends. Ghiba is when you talk about someone in a way that he does not like, that would offend him, in a way that would hurt him behind his back. If he comes in front of you, would you dare to say this to him? Would that offend him, hurt him in public? If the answer is yes, then that is ghiba and you cannot say that. If you have an issue with a person, call him privately, privately, where no one listens to you, no one hears you, and you discuss with him privately, not publicly in front of everybody else. Then that is ghiba. Then you're trying to insult that individual, and doing so will anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of us do that on a regular basis? Do we really love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? The answer is yes. How much do we love Rasulullah? That varies. But the Prophet is very compassionate, very merciful. If we turn to him and ask him to forgive us, as the ayah says, وَإِنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا الله. وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولُ لَوَجَدُ اللَّهَ تَوَّابَ الرَّحِيمًا And if they, when they oppress themselves, come to do istighfar from Allah and ask you to do istighfar for them, come to you, Ya Rasulullah, for istighfar, then they will find Allah all forgiving, all merciful. So now, from this day, mu'mineen and mu'minat, turn your hearts to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, to the imams alayhim salam and say, Ya Ahl al-Bayt, Ya Rasulullah, we have come to you confessing to you of our shortcomings, of our sins, and we ask you, Ya Rasulullah, to ask Allah to forgive us. We ask you to pray for us. We ask you to forgive us, to bless us, to make us and our children until the day of progeny among your sincere followers. From this week, try to promise Rasulullah, I will say the truth. I will do the truth. I will try to act to the best of my ability in the path of the pleasure of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Watch my anger for one week. From this week, as a gift to Rasulullah, don't be angry for a week. This is a gift to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, because he never became angry other than for the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tell Rasulullah this week for a week I will try to help some mu'mineen, some people. Qurbatan ila Allah ta'ala. For your sake ya Rasulullah, for you. Tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, I will promise to become a better individual for you ya Rasulullah. So that I become a good brother of yours. The brother that you said, peace be upon you, my brothers. I want to be a good brother and a good follower and a good servant of you. Raise your hand for dua, mu'mineen and mu'minat. As this is the time when inshallah dua is accepted. We're in the eve of this holy eve of this year.
the 17th day of Rabi'ul Awwal, a day which is one of the four days of the year that is highly recommended to fast. The wilada of the man who is a mercy to the universe, a man whom Allah gives him his attributes by calling him Ra'ufun Rahim. If you call him right now while you are his guests, inshallah he will accept and he will listen to you and give you your haja. And we all have hajat. We all have needs. Let us all call Allah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amma yujibu al-mudtarra idha da'a wa yakshifu al-su'a. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا يا الله كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار يا الله إلهي برسول الله اجعلنا وذريتنا إلى يوم الدين من شيعة محمد وآل محمد المتقين يا الله واجعلنا من خدمة محمد وآل محمد المخلصين يا الله إلهي برسول الله أنصر شيعة أمير المؤمنين في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها يا الله إلهي برسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص من أوصونا بالدعاء منهم اللهم ألبسهم لباس العافية واقض حوائجهم واحفظهم في بيوتهم وديارهم يا الله رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربيان صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل هو ليا وحا هو قائدا ونا هو دليلا وعين حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم ارزقنا زيارة رسول الله عاجلا يا الله وشفاعته في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة يا الله 
اللهم نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغمة عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح مات الجالسين والحاضرين والباذلين على الخصوص إلى روح المرحوم القارئ الحاج محمد علي أوحدي رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات اللهم صل على محمد